What I want to do with you as a sort of Christmas special, I suppose, uh, for Surrey is to transport you um, 250 miles or so north uh, to talk about the work we've been doing in Aldborough um, in uh, North Yorkshire uh, since 2009. And this is a project um, that I've been uh, leading with Rose Ferraby, a uh, former student of mine, and uh, as you see from this image, uh, quite an exciting artist as well as a, an archaeologist um, who happened to have been brought up in uh, Aldborough and encouraged uh, me to take an interest in it just over a decade ago. Um, Aldborough, <coughs> if I can move on, um, Aldborough, for those of you who don't uh, know it, um, is quite a picturesque uh, little village just off the A1 um, to the northwest of York, in the middle of the Vale of York. Um, it is uh, now uh, comparatively well understood as the result of work over the past few years. And it was in the Roman period, um, the Civitas capital of the tribe of the Brigantes, um, who uh, occupied the bulk of what is now Northern England, uh, North and West Yorkshire, um, up into County Durham and across the Pennines into Lancashire and into Cumbria. Uh, the importance of the site is that it is one of the major towns of Roman Britain, the Civitas capitals. Um, it's the northernmost such, um, with the exception of Carlisle on the west. And um, <clears throat> it is also particularly interesting as it's one of the sort of semi-greenfield Roman town sites, uh, which in, means that we're able to uh, explore it um, in a variety of different ways, as we'll uh, see. Sorry, let's try and move this on correctly. Um, today, as I've said, it's a uh, picturesque uh, little village um, on the edge of uh, Borough Bridge, slightly larger town. Um, the Roman limits of the town uh, run from the defences that you can see uh, up here, down here, round, back, up here. Um, the medieval village on it, uh, on the site, um, is artificially uh, reduced in size uh, because this was one of the rotten boroughs of Elizabeth I and until uh, from the 1560s until 1832 um, it was distinguished by returning two members of parliament. So the uh, landowner um, for most of the period we're interested in, um, the Duke of Newcastle, um, prevented anyone else building on it to keep the cost of bribing the electors uh, down to modest proportions. Uh, so there are only 14 um, electors through most of the 18th century. As a result of that, um, Aldborough has remained uh, largely undeveloped and um, the northern part of the town, much of the uh, western part of the town remain in open fields. Um, the Settlement itself is one which has uh, been the subject of archaeological work since the uh, late 17th century and was particularly a focus of interest um, through the period in the uh, period from 1825 to about 1850 when um, Andrew Lawson uh, purchased the village from um, the Duke of Newcastle and uh, he himself was um, something of an antiquarian and uh, he sponsored um, quite large-scale archaeological work uh, that was published just before his death in um, a beautiful volume uh, published in 1852, Reliquae Isuriani. If you ever get an opportunity to have a look at it, it's beautiful with uh, lovely pictures of the mosaics and so forth that he uh, uh, excavated. And um, as an aside, it's also interesting from the 
uh, antiquarian and archaeological history of this period, as uh, through excavating, he also developed a, an antiquarian garden behind um, his house site, elements of which still um, exist till today. But from the uh, later 19th century onwards, um, Andrew Lawson's descendants, who incidentally still own the site and have been very welcoming to us, um, were generally not very encouraging of archaeologists. And um, as a result, from the late 19th century until uh, really the 1990s, comparatively little archaeological work was done, with the exception of a couple of interludes in the 1920s and 30s uh, that we'll return to later. So when we turn to look at the site um, in the first decade of this century, um, we were attracted by the possibility of doing geophysical survey, uh, following up the sort of work that I've been doing um, elsewhere in the Roman Empire, applying geophysical techniques to mapping Roman towns. So the work we've been doing has gone through a series of phases and what I want to do this evening is to give you um, a little bit of an insight into the range and variety of the work that we've been doing. It's now quite a big project so it's far more than I can do in detail in an hour. And in the second part of the lecture I want to show how we've used that evidence to begin the process of rewriting both the history of Aldborough and uh, more broadly um, the history of the Roman North. So the, the main technique that we were using for the first part of our uh, work was um, applying magnetometry survey which is something I'm sure that is familiar to you all. With this technique uh, we started by focusing at a small scale on the patches of land within the town walls, basically in that area, um, using handheld magnetometers. This is Rose doing uh, the area up by the uh, amphitheatre here um, in 2011 or 12. Uh, we then subsequently moved out to map the uh, suburbs of the town leading up to the river here, uh, the road up to Hadrian's Wall, uh, down the road to York here and out in the uh, western and southern suburbs and we're currently undertaking um, an expansion of that to look at in detail at the uh, areas beyond the town um, looking at uh, rural settlement in the area. We're running at the moment about 280 hectares of geophysics and we've moved uh, from handheld magnetometers um, to this rather splendid array um, of uh, Forster magnetometers uh, satellite located and towed by a quad bike. So you can do about 10 hectares of magnetometry in a day. And we've been very fortunate with this, um, that the uh, soils in this area are um, extremely uh, good for magnetometry survey showing very strong uh, distinctions uh, between the background and the buried structures. So on the left hand side of the screen here we see uh, Rose's uh, interpretation of the geophysics results. Uh, again you can I hope just see the uh, defences of the town, I'll come back to um, a moment, parts of the street grid here, the uh, road running up to the river crossing the river uh, to go on to Hadrian's Wall in that direction and Malton in that direction and uh, the enclosures along the lines of the road uh, leading out to York. And if we just focus in on uh, part of the um, intramural area here, uh, you can see, I hope, um, both the magnetic signals of the ditches, the town wall coming round here and within uh, a number of buildings showing up as positive responses uh, with the uh, street grid showing up as well. And if we um, focus uh, in on uh, Rose's interpretation of part of this area here, uh, you can see that by um, plotting the 
positives and negatives uh, across um, the detailed area, we're able to build up a really very fine picture of the uh, various structures within the town and understand uh, something more of its layout and the layout of the areas around. But um, the issue with uh, magnetometry is that it gives you a very fine two-dimensional image. Uh, what we've also been experimenting with, um, applying uh, techniques, again, uh, we've been uh, using in Italy is working with our colleagues from uh, Ghent University, uh, particularly Levin Verdonk, who you see here with his quad bike. Um, we have a sort of quad bike fest in Aldborough. Um, he's towing um, a series of ground pen penetrating radar antennae that are um, again uh, fixed by satellite imagery to um, precise location. And by driving up and down, um, towing uh, now um, 16 radar antennae behind, uh, we can get very high resolution uh, radar images of parts of the site. And as you'll see in a moment, that enables us to differentiate structures by depth. And to give you an idea of the um, resolution we've got on this, uh, we're now collecting data at um, six and a half centimetre intervals um, across the uh, whole site. So you can see um, something the size of a dinner plate under about uh, two metres of soil, if there's something the size of a dinner plate to see. Um, and I would just want to give you a, an inkling of what these results look like. This is part of the area in the um, uh, south uh, west quarter of the town. Um, and what we see here is uh, the geophysics results um, very close to the surface. And what the, we're able to do with this is to then uh, move down in depth through um, the surface. I'm afraid this one doesn't have the depth showing on it. But as we go down, um, the archaeology begins to emerge. Um, I hope you can begin to see uh, some walls showing up here, road, some uh, linear feature running across. As we go a little deeper, um, those uh, structures begin to emerge more clearly. And up here, we start seeing uh, some other buildings. And as we go down through greater depth, uh, you begin to see further buildings emerging up here. Down here we're seeing a pair of apses um, and these darker uh, features uh, where there's no reflection, the lighter features are the reflections. So what you're beginning to see are floors and floor makeups um, underneath them. And as we go down further, um, you see uh, different elements of the building. The apses have now disappeared and we're into subfloor makeup. Um, but we can see the uh, structure there disappearing right through. So if I run through that um, again rather more rapidly, you can get an impression of the, how the archaeology is changing through depth and time. And we haven't done um, an enormous amount of that. We focused that uh, GPR work um, both in areas where the magnetometry was not particularly clear and as we'll see in a moment, um, on uh, streets, uh, the modern streets, where magnetometry is impossible, but um, the good contact of the radar antennae with the tarmac um, enables you to get a very good uh, impression of what's beneath. The other element of our um, remote sensing work has been uh, to develop um, a, pro a program of um, coring with my colleague Charlie French from the archaeology department here. And we've been looking in this at the uh, buried archaeology in the floodplain of the River Ewer. The river is running up here. We're to the north of the town, the uh, northernmost extent of the defences here. This is the road running up to the river and to 
uh, a bridge crossing we've seen before with um, a whole series of enclosures and rich and furrow on top. In the areas closest to the river, it's clear that the um, geomorphology has changed the landscape very greatly since the Roman period. And what we've been trying to do is to trace the uh, Roman period uh, landscape uh, underneath the uh, colluvium. And in doing that, uh, we were very fortunate at this point uh, to um, find a relict river channel, which had um, something like um, five or six meters of peat in it surviving. And this gives us a pollen diagram for the uh, area of the Roman town. Um, the Roman period is about uh, here. Uh, we've got Iron Age uh, clearance um, and uh, a sequence that's running up, we think, to around about AD 1000. I'll come back to um, other significance of this later, but in terms of understanding the town and its immediate hinterland, um, the discovery of this uh, pollen sequence is uh, particularly um, exciting and uh, we're uh, currently doing uh, further work on that and around the rest of the uh, landscape to try and uh, fit the town into its uh, natural environment and also its contemporary economic environment. So, um, so from 2009 till 2014 or thereabouts, we focused on geophysics. Uh, more recently, we've been focusing on um, the uh, issue of coring and the geomorphology. And running alongside that, um, as the project developed, we decided it was um, of key importance to try and collate all previous research on the site. Um, this has been a fascinating uh, process uh, which has led me into all kinds of interesting um, antiquarian work going back to the Reverend Morris who was the vicar uh, from uh, the 1680s to the 1720s uh, who collated a lot of information. Um, the work that I've already referred to by Andrew Lawson in the uh, second decade of the 19th century. And we've also been drawing together all the stuff from more recent planning uh, work, small excavations that were undertaken largely by Dorothy Charlesworth in the 1950s and 60s, uh, again, in advance of um, uh, development. So uh, when these houses were built, Dorothy Charlesworth dug these things. And um, draw, trying to draw all that together with the geophysics survey evidence to get um, a complete picture of what we already understand of the town. And that, um, uh, it's just, I I've, I've lost an image there, but it doesn't matter very much. Um, what that image would have shown is that um, we have um, something around 101 um, interventions uh, in Aldborough. Um, some of which, uh, like the um, gas main replacement and sewer pipes, have um, 70 or 80 individual observations. So drawing this together and trying to make sense of it and link it to the excavated material um, and the <coughs> geophysics uh, has been particularly rewarding. And you can see um, just here where we've got the defences of the town, the ditches found in the geophysics, you can tie that into um, 1960s excavations and then get the dating evidence uh, from that. Well, that led us to was the understanding that um, we needed more chronological um, evidence from Aldborough, but as it's a scheduled site, um, rather than opening um, previously undisturbed areas, um, in 2016, in discussion with uh, what's now um, Historic England, we put together a program of work of reopening past excavations to get um, new stratigraphic evidence and particularly dating evidence from them. And this program um, started off with a very modest piece of work in 2016 when we um, looked at the area 
next to um, two of the mosaics that are currently on display um, in the uh, English heritage uh, part of the site. The English heritage site comprises largely the area around the walls at the southwest corner, um, little museum and these two mosaics. The mosaics had been um, exposed in the uh, Lawson campaign of excavations in the second part of the uh, 19th century and uh, were at the time recorded as part of um, a corner of uh, what appears to be a large um, courtyard building, courtyard here, with a bath suite. And our geophysics um, shows further evidence for the courtyard building here. And this building you will have recognised, I hope, from the uh, radar survey. And what we decided to do was to um, test the accuracy of the uh, 19th century excavation simply by reopening part of the uh, bathhouse. We dug a very small trench by hand, uh, removing the backfill and exposing the structures that had been found. What that demonstrated um, was that the uh, drawings that we had from the 1850 publication um, were extremely accurate. They're within a couple of centimetres of uh, accuracy and it's when you see what they were recording um, you can make much better sense. In this particular instance uh, we didn't go uh, any deeper, we didn't uh, go into undisturbed soil, we simply uh, recorded what was there um, which includes a large amount of debris from the 19th century pub that had been used to backfill uh, the trench um, uh, in the uh, 1860s or thereabouts. But this was important in enabling us to uh, be certain that that work uh, was done um, on a quite a large scale in the uh, 1820s, 30s and 40s um, was of uh, quality. And it also reassured us that the uh, buildings that had been exposed um, hadn't been uh, left to frost and fall apart. They'd been backfilled relatively quickly. Uh, uh, emboldened by that um, experience, we um, then decided to uh, take on a, a slightly more um, complex problem, which was to explore um, the area that was believed to be the Forum. Uh, this was um, published first um, by uh, Goff in his 1789 edition of Camden's Britannia, which you see the image here, um, and has been interpreted since the 1950s as the um, northern range of the Forum building uh, covering the centre of the town uh, with the churchyard in the middle of it, as you see here. Our antiquarian research um, revealed an unpublished previous plan of the same excavation uh, that was um, made probably by Eli Hargrove in 1770 when the work took place and survives in um, a folio in the York Public Record Office of um, his son who happened to be the uh, proprietor of the one of the York papers in the early 19th century and put together a, a book on the history of York uh, in 1818 using his father's notes and so forth uh, which he put together uh, in a sort of folio which has survived and in that uh, we found um, this drawing which is clearly um, related to the published goth drawing but appears to be um, its uh, predecessor rather than um, a copy of it uh, because uh, the uh, Goff uh, text um, mentions a whole series of things that are shown on the uh, key to this drawing, uh, including the fine spot of the gold coin of Trajan uh, over here, um, various other things, uh, which Goff had picked up but are not shown on Hill's illustrations. Furthermore, unlike the Goff illustration, the Hargrove one shows uh, vignettes of buildings in the background, which you can still identify today. Um, 
the ship in the present pub is this building and the farmhouse next door uh, still survive, although uh, now with brick uh, front as these buildings gone. And this enabled us to um, <clears throat> uh, confirm the goth illustrations and this led us to a program of doing um, radar work along the street in front of the church which picked out um, what we thought were the cross walls of the forum which in a very narrow and difficult to locate uh, excavation in 2017 we then found the walls of the forum again um, these are this wall this wall again uh, when you plot that, uh, the Hargrove plan against um, our excavated plan, um, you find that the uh, 1770 plan is remarkably accurate and uh, this enables us to um, geo-reference the uh, forum accurately and tie it in with other work that we uh, were... Whoops, sorry. Um, that's it, that's bad. Sorry, um, I jumped a slide again there. Um, we we're able to uh, georeference the 18th century finds and tie it in with other work we did with um, rather painstaking radar work um, amongst the gravestones in the churchyard, which enable us to reconstruct the outline of the forum that's here, um, tied in uh, with the other elements of the street grid um, on this image. And we were uh, excavating, as you could see, a little trench cross there that gives us that. That happens to be the entrance to the forum, which uh, aligns with the road uh, up to Hadrian's Wall. These elements seem to fit together to suggest the overall plan for the square. Um, this was a logistically quite complicated uh, process because we're right next to the church wall, um, dodging the services underneath the grass verge um, and having to fulfil the requirements of the highways uh, agency in uh, doing what is essentially uh, digging a hole in the road. But we were able to get down to pre-forum deposits, uh, which we date to uh, somewhere around circa AD 70, so very soon after the Roman conquest of this part of the north. Um, we were able to look at the construction deposits for the forum, which give a construction date around about AD 120, um, which ties in with the uh, gold coin of Trajan that is found around about here in 1770. Um, we were able to um, identify the spoliation of the building, the lifting of its floors and so forth, which is radiocarbon dated to the late 4th, early 5th century with a little bit of smithing. And uh, as a rather nice uh, final touch, um, the truncation of 1770, uh, we were able to uh, find um, a trowel that was apparently used for excavating the site um, at that time, which gives a rather beautiful uh, circle to the archaeology um, in that instance. Our third um, small piece of excavation looked at some work that was done um, in the 1920s, um, small scale excavation done by local school teacher and some friends um, in 1924, which uh, was largely designed to trace the Roman road going north from the town. The excavation was never published, but there is an archive surviving, the main uh, useful element of which are a series of really quite good plans and sections, uh, very carefully drawn um, and recorded, uh, but the finds and so forth have disappeared. And um, by uh, looking at their drawing and their surveying, we were able to locate this structure, Masonry T, as, um, sorry, as part of um, this building that shows up in the geophysics, which is a huge um, 
structure something around 60 meters long, which forms part of a sequence of such big buildings uh, running up between the edge of the street grid and the edge of the town defenses uh, in the uh, right up in the uh, northeast corner of the town. Um, this, I'm afraid, was uh, it was a lovely excavation, beautiful archaeology, but it was um, in that period known as the Beast from the East, uh, when um, the Arctic weather swept down across uh, northern England um, in March 2018. So we were unable to dig as much as we would have liked, but we relocated um, the wall found in um, 1924. Um, associated floor levels and we were able to take a small sondage uh, down to the natural beneath, look at the foundations of the wall and um, also uh, part of the area of the street just to the north bit. Again, um, the sequence of buried soil at the bottom has material from around about AD 70 showing uh, the time of the origins of the town. Um, we can construct date the construction of the building to around the middle of the third century. Our original hypothesis was that it's slightly um, askew to the street grid. And we wondered whether it was a relic of an earlier plan system. It turns out not to be, it turns out to be mid third century. And it looks as though it is part of a huge um, warehouse. Uh, these big uh, warehouses, um, come back to the significance of them uh, historically later, can be paralleled in a few sites in Eastern Europe around about the same time, and are probably to do with um, the control of uh, produce by the state as part of the tax system. Interestingly, <coughs> the building goes out of use um, around the middle of the fourth century, and there is then a huge dump of material uh, that covers the wall, which is why it stands so high. Um, that dump, we now understand, is associated with strengthening the town wall sometime after the middle of the fourth century, and seems to be part of the process of um, redefending the town, uh, something that we'll come back to again um, in a few moments. <clears throat> now, final piece of um, re-excavation, um, to start in 2019 and was then delayed by COVID. We've just uh, finished this um, September uh, doing a second season of the area. Again, we focused on an area in the northern part of the town, right by the edge of the street grid here, the road coming up to Hadrian's Wall here, top of the street grid here, um, an area which had been um, somewhat um, oddly excavated in 1924. Um, we didn't understand what they had done. Um, to some extent, we still don't, but we, they had opened quite a large area, which gave us an opportunity to, uh, we hope, uh, get down to uh, look further at the origins of the town. And again, um, this is uh, the picture of the excavation from the 1920s. Uh, it emerges that they had cleared quite a large area of topsoil. And there are some photographs showing this. They had then found um, a whole series of interesting bits of architectural material, um, plus an inscribed milestone. And they seem then to have um, just sort of spread out looking for further bits of um, inscription and so forth in a slightly less disciplined way than in their other excavation we looked at. What we did was to come in and um, in 2019 we opened quite a large area and then we discovered it was very complicated so we excavated just a strip down either side across there leaving the middle bit. Um, we've come back in uh, August September this year uh, to uh, excavate further in the middle um, and we have got a really very, very interesting sequence here uh, that we're only uh, part way through understanding. Um, the most uh, surprising and uh, most exciting stuff comes from the very top of this. Um, you see uh, on the right here, uh, the latest surface of the uh, northernmost street in the street grid. 
Um, that's running along here. The road to Hadrian's Wall is running up the side here. And um, this turns out to be um, a largely unplowed uh, late antique sequence. Um, there are a complex of buildings um, with uh, lines of timber frames on uh, post pads, um, reusing to some extent uh, querns, as you see along here. Um, other huge post pads running across here, uh, further querns and uh, surfaces. Um, we're still um, pulling this apart and uh, analysing the material from it. We're only a couple of months off uh, site here. From 2019, we had um, quite a lot of worked antler, which has given us radiocarbon dates um, that lead into the fifth century here. And in the final stages of this part of the uh, area, um, there is um, a huge midden of animal bones and so forth uh, dumped on uh, top of these structures, um, together with uh, lots of evidence for bone and antler working. So what this is giving us is um, a very uh, significant, I think, late Roman and early post-Roman sequence um, showing um, how the uh, settlement uh, continued uh, beyond the conventional end of Roman uh, occupation. Beneath that complex, we are just coming down to, um, in the area we excavated in 2019 and further this year, um, uh, evidence for a big, um, sorry, um, a big stone built structure. Um, we've got one element of the wall here, a robber trench with the uh, street surfaces coming up to it uh, that apparently dates to the third century. This wall is a metre thick um, and we have the robbed wall, uh, another bit here, what looks like an internal wall here and bits of paving the floor. So our intention is to go back um, next September to strip um, the rest of this late sequence off to take it apart and understand uh, more of this um, rather grand building uh, that uh, runs underneath it and also to further explore the area that we've only seen in um, our sort of small 2019 uh, down cutting which is a second century um, smith thing complex. Um, this is uh, quite extraordinarily uh, large. Um, it, these sort of varve deposits at the back are um, 50 centimetres or so of uh, floor levels and uh, trample of ash and slag. Um, the scale of this is uh, very large in terms of uh, ironworking and um, interestingly and significantly they are using coal on a large scale as the raw material here. So uh, what we're uh, intending to do is to excavate this further in 2021 and also to try and get uh, through this and down to the bottom of the sequence. We're somewhere in the second century at the moment so we've got um, probably 40 or 50 years to go. A rather nice find from 2019 from the um, later wall foundations is this fragment of a Norton Ware Smith's pot. You can see the tongs, the hammer, and the anvil, uh, which come from uh, close by, and uh, I suspect may be um, a votive uh, pot uh, that may be related to the uh, finishing of the uh, smithy and its uh, ceiling by later buildings put on top. That's somewhat speculative, but um, notwithstanding um, the pot itself, um, we've got really useful um, insight here, uh, which um, my colleagues in the McDonald Institute are working with us on, on looking at the um, technology and the uh, scale of industry uh, that is taking place here in the second century. And um, incidentally, alongside the uh, analysis of the iron working, 
there is very strong evidence from uh, soil sampling in this area that they're also working lead on quite a large scale, something again I'll come back to in a second. So I hope that gives you um, a good overview of what we've been doing. What I now want to do is to lead you through um, something of what that um, might mean and how we can uh, interpret that um, in a broader historical context. And in order to do this, uh, we need to, I think, look at um, what's happening uh, through time um, and uh, revisit some other bits of work around about. And I should start here by saying that the um, conventional historical account of the development of Aldborough um, has seen it as a Roman town that very much develops out of a fort. Um, the suggestion uh, until the 1990s um, was that there was um, an auxiliary fort underneath Aldborough, which uh, following the sort of uh, John Wacher model um, was converted into a town uh, sometime in the second century AD. That model was somewhat um, thrown into doubt uh, when the A1 was widened in the 1990s and um, a fort was found at Rowcliffe, which dates um, on numismatic grounds to uh, the period of the conquest of the area, founded around AD 70 and uh, abandoned around about AD 80 to 85 on our reanalysis of the coins. Mike Bishop, when he published the Rowcliffe Fort, suggested that it was abandoned somewhat earlier and probably lasted only 10 years and was succeeded by a second fort uh, in the 80s at Aldborough. Um, as you'll see in a moment, our work, I think, um, undermines that concept. But what I would like to point out is that um, the work that we've been doing seems to show that the primary route um, at the time of uh, conquest in the 70s um, is running from York, uh, basically up the Ewer Valley, um, following the edge of the river and crossing the river Ewer um, at Rowcliffe. So the auxiliary fort is, as you would expect, controlling crossing point the river. Um, That leads me, just as an aside, um, to um, point out that if you start looking at what's going on in uh, Northern Britain at the time of the conquest around AD 70, the conventional view is that the Romans moved basically northwards up the Vale of York, um, and it's a sort of one column either side of the Pennines. I think there's accumulating evidence, firstly, that um, the Roman uh, annexation first took place via Stanek and then across to Carlisle in the pre um, AD 70 period with the uh, uh, work at Stanek and most recently at Scotch Corner, suggesting that it's coming um, up the Tees and going that way. Um, I myself follow the view that the same happens further south and that what we're seeing is the road from the coast up to York and up going to um, Rowcliffe is part of this um, east-west move of conquest and the current evidence to me suggests that the link that is now the A1 is something that follows only a decade or so later. That um, helps us um, understand uh, the broader context for the development of Aldborough with the initial road uh, running to a river crossing at Rowcliffe as we've just seen. We've been able through collating previous finds to demonstrate that, um, sorry jumping around again, um, the, the earliest finds, the Flavian finds, are basically in the northern part of the town and the flat area over towards the river. And they cover an area that um, 
I think is much too big for an auxiliary fort, it covers somewhere between um, 10 and uh, 20 hectares uh, of activity that is taking place relatively quickly after AD 70, so contemporaneously with the fort at Rowcliffe. There are military artefacts, but not enough to suggest um, uh, a fort presence. Um, there's a lack of any evidence for um, an indigenous centre here. And what I'm suggesting is that uh, we're, what we're seeing here is the uh, development of a trading settlement, not um, unparalleled by what goes on earlier in London, significantly uh, at the point which is on the head of navigation of the River Ewer, at the place where um, the new Roman communication route of the road comes closest to the river. And we've got an area uh, where material can be transported from road to river, um, stored, moved on. And I would see that myself as probably the product of um, traders and people uh, following the uh, economic um, opportunities of uh, invasion rather than the army themselves. Now that ties in with um, other information that comes from the immediate area, particularly the area um, up uh, in the foothills of the Pennines, a little to the west of us, um, where uh, there is evidence from the 18th century that um, lead and importantly silver production has started by AD 81. And this um, is significant as uh, in later years, when uh, lead was exploited in this part of the Pennines, both in the 12th, 13th century and down to the 18th century, um, that lead was brought overland um, to the Ewer at Aldborough um, and Borough Bridge before being taken downstream. And we're suggesting that a similar pattern is taking place um, in uh, the uh, late 70s and 80s. And the significance of that is that the Romans weren't interested in the lead per se, but were rather the silver that um, can be extracted from this lead. And that means there's a really good context for uh, both the military base at Rowcliffe overlooking um, the uh, production areas uh, and also the um, development of a commercial settlement uh, on the river at Rowcliffe. And interestingly, returning to our pollen core, um, we're currently doing um, chemical analysis of the uh, pollen core itself uh, to measure the pollution um, that uh, comes from metalworking. Uh, we haven't got the uh, results of that back yet, um, but it's interesting that the pollen core itself um, shows a very major peak of um, carbon pollution, soot and uh, charcoal um, around uh, this period and we suspect that when we um, get the analysis of the uh, chemical composition cores back which is being done um, literally as we speak at the moment uh, we're going to be able to map the extent to which uh, Aldborough was acting as um, the centre for uh, production of um, lead and the working of lead uh, in uh, the first century AD. That stage in the town seems to have been superseded by uh, the development of a planned town. I've already indicated when we looked at the forum that the forum gives us, uh, uh, it seems to be laid out in relation to the street grid with the entrance to the forum um, axially on what becomes the new road to the bridge up by the river. So you get the element of town planning with forum, street grid laid out, terracing of the southern part of the town, large scale movement of earth here uh, to create the town plan. And um, at the same time as that, the uh, construction of a new route up to Hadrian's Wall, quite possibly um, the construction of the amphitheatre at the same time. Um, our small scale excavations um, seem to indicate that, that is happening around about um, AD 120. And that would tie in with, um, of course, what's going on elsewhere in the north at this stage uh, with um, changes in the legionary disposition and the construction of 
um, Hadrian's Wall and the uh, whole um, development of uh, settlement elsewhere um, in the region. And this does appear to be uh, part of a large scale planned uh, development at Aldborough. Very rapidly, that newly planned town um, expands out uh, in the grid is uh, extended. Um, a town wall is built, we think, um, round about 150 to 180, somewhat earlier than other towns in Roman Britain. Um, you can see a nice uh, image from the 1930s excavation showing part of that uh, town wall. Um, it's an integral wall and uh, bank, uh, not the wall following the bank. And um, what follows on from that is the development, <coughs> sorry, um, the development of uh, the uh, areas that we've seen in the geophysics previously of um, settlement to the north leading up to the river, uh, structures running out into the field systems, uh, field systems quarrying and industry around here, and largely cemeteries to the on the road to York. As this um, develops, uh, the defences themselves are extended uh, with new ditches built on the outside, um, annexes to the north and to the east here, and the construction of um, interval towers, bastions, if you will, and then uh, a sequence that excavations both round the south gate and round the east gate show run from the uh, second century right through uh, to the fourth. The annexes um, round the gates um, are apparently long lived, we'll see in a moment, and we're suggesting they may be to do with um, the role of the town within the uh, system of supply and taxation. Um, we showed you previously the um, large warehouses of Araya um, that were sampled in 2018. There are a whole series of uh, lead ceilings from this area, uh, which indicate the involvement of the uh, government in uh, this uh, region. And we reasonably, I think, associate these lead ceilings with the collection of taxes in kind and suggest that the warehouses are also part of that. So the town in the third and fourth centuries is uh, continuing as a Sort of major center with its mosaics and houses and so forth, but is also developing um, a greater role in uh, the administration of taxation in the region. And uh, interestingly, some of these uh, lead ceilings um, can be traced uh, up the road, suggesting that um, the town was um, integral in the supply of uh, material to Hadrian's Wall at this period. Um, finally, um, taking us back to the uh, late antique, uh, where our excavation up here is beginning to show um, very promising evidence. There is um, strong evidence from a whole series of different areas that the town um, continued um, certainly into the fifth century and that um, there may be strands of continuity running through uh, to the later medieval period. By the late medieval period at Doomsday, uh, Aldborough was a very major um, centre still. The uh, gap is of course between the 5th um, and the 9th, 10th centuries. Um, interestingly, um, our geophysics shows that the latest phase of defence is here which we think must date to the late 4th or early 5th century, which uh, incidentally cut through the amphitheatre, are themselves cut through by a road um, that is uh, built through the wall and across the defences, which must therefore um, date to uh, sometime very late in the sequence. Um, <clears throat> there is then evidence from the pollen that you've already seen, which shows that agricultural exploitation in this area seems to have continued strongly through um, the 5th to 9th centuries. And there is a 
possibility that um, this is the uh, site of the town besieged by Cadwalla in 633635, conventionally seen as York, but the text doesn't mention which settlement it is. Um, and then finally, um, at a later period, um, the amphitheatre itself is uh, re-fortified and can be identified with um, a 12th, 13th century castle. As we've seen, the church is built in the churchyard. The church itself, as it is today, is 13th, uh, 14th century structure, but its dedication seems to be um, late Saxon. And um, there is also very good evidence that the both the medieval boundaries within the settlement and the layout of the uh, rig and furrow in the areas around the town are following and respecting relict features in the overall landscape. And what this does, I think, for us is to not uh, give us a conclusive evidence that um, Aldborough uh, has um, a strong um, sub-Roman and post-Roman history, but rather gives us a series of clues um, that uh, should part, form part of the um, agenda for future uh, work. So I'll finish there. I hope that's given you a um, pretty good idea um, that Aldborough's um, not a uh, town to be neglected, but rather one that I hope you'll come and visit um, and enjoy for yourselves at some stage. Thank you very much indeed.